Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Yeovil Vineyard Church to our online service. I'm Karen. This is my husband, John. Hello. Welcome. If you're visiting us today, then you are especially welcome. And we really hope that you feel at home and comfortable with us this morning. So we're going to start our, our worship with about 20 minutes of singing. So please feel free to, to join in or just sit back and listen to the music. Uh, and then we'll bring a talk on the topic of the day, followed again by a worship song. So you can just reflect on what's being said. At the end, please don't rush away. There's all the information that you need to connect with us. As I said, if you are visiting, please um, keep those details and we'd love to hear from you. Hi, Matt and Sarah here. Before we transition into a time of worship together, I'm going to read a passage from the Bible and Sarah is going to pray for us. I'm going to be reading from Matthew 1. 20 through to 23. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, if you would like to join me um, for a prayer. Heavenly Father, Emmanuel, God, you are with us. And we thank you this morning. And we turn our eyes to you at this time of Advent. And we thank you for all that you have done for us through your son, Jesus. Help us in this special time just to seek more of you, to seek your face. We give you praise and we give you glory. Amen. Amen.
have your way
and I feel no shame I'm secure in your embrace All the striving ends I don't have to You're the potter, I'm the clay. I am healed and changed in the wonder of your grace. I surrender. Strongholds into freedom Turn my doubting into faith Turn my suffering into glory Till I can't help but
Jesus, show us how much you love humility. Oh, Holy Spirit, be the star that leads us to the humble heart of love we see in you. Amen. Oh, come, oh, come, he may.
Good morning, church. Wow, just like that, we have arrived at the end of the year, and this is the final uh, service of the year, apart from uh, a Christmas morning or a Christmas day service that we will be providing online. So this Advent, we've been looking at uh, the arrival of Jesus uh, as the King of Kings and the impact and the significance of his arrival. We have seen him as the coming king, the promised blessing that is to bless all the nations on earth. And uh, this morning I want to look at the kingdom of God because uh, where the implications of the coming king is that there is a kingdom. That God's kingdom is unlike any other kingdom the world has ever seen because it is so contrary to what the world has expected. You know, Israel was waiting for a Messiah that would establish a nationalist kingdom uh, through political and military power. But instead, what we got was an upside down, inside out, back to front, super cultural, naturally supernatural and eternally becoming kingdom. So let's just look at kingdom as a, as a quick definition. Um, so what do you think of when you hear the word kingdom? So many of us, especially when you live in the UK, you may have an idea of, you know, the United Kingdom and uh, the king or the queen. But in biblical terms, the kingdom of God is everywhere where God's rule and reign is made perfect. So consider that Jesus was the first person in history that did the good and perfect will of the Father. So in Jesus, in and through Jesus, the kingdom came. Because in Jesus, the, the, the rule and the reign of the Father was made perfect. And as we accept Jesus into our lives, the kingdom becomes a part of us as well. So I want to look at a few aspects of this kingdom. The first is that it is an upside down kingdom. You know, earthly kingdoms have uh, hierarchies of power and position. Uh, there's all kinds of titles of honor, like your majesty, your highness, your grace, your eminence, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister. But in God's kingdom, the greatest is at the bottom and the least is at the top. In Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28, it says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high priests, uh, their high officials, exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now that's really strange, isn't it? In this upside down kingdom, it is humility that makes you great, not privilege. Matthew 23, 12 says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's just upside down. Since our king then so humbled himself to be obedient unto death, can you imagine just how ugly and how sinful and an evil thing pride would be in his presence? So in Ephesians 4 verse 2, it says that we are to be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. That's a pretty upside-down kingdom, isn't it? The second point I want to make is that God's kingdom is an inside-out kingdom. It's a crazy thing, but God's kingdom does not exist for itself, but for others. You know, in our culture, uh, I am a consumer and everything exists for me. But God's kingdom is missional. In John 3, verse 16 to 17, 
We read, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So Jesus did not come as a king to rule over us. He did not do it for himself. He did it for the Father and for us. In this way, the kingdom that came in Jesus exists for the sake of those who were or are not yet in the kingdom. Because it is the power of God's love that is, that is compelling it to do unto others. In Luke 15, verse 3 to 7, we read, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he is joyful and puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, they all have the same message, that God's kingdom is an inside-out kingdom that exists to, to find and save that which has been lost. My third point is that God's kingdom is a back-to-front kingdom. Uh, in the kingdoms of this world, uh, leaders want to be seen. They, they want to demonstrate their power. Uh, it is the rich who benefit and the poor are abused and exploited or forgotten. It is the educated that lord it over the uneducated. It is the winners who take the prize at the expense of the losers. In stark contrast, Jesus says it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, and it is the poor who enter freely, and the rich ones are the ones that need help to enter. Uh, Jesus also said that many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So even, uh, even the race does not always go to the winner. So when it comes to education and power, we read in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Again and again, we are counseled to seek God. Uh, unlike earthly kings, he is hidden and it requires earnest faith to find him. So uh, we are taught that uh, we have a right to life, and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But Jesus says in Matthew 6 verse 33, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Earthly kingdoms are imposed on us, but the kingdom of God is a choice. Uh, being British is a consequence of chance, but the kingdom of God is a considered act of reason to accept an invitation into royalty. My fourth point is that the kingdom of God is a supracultural kingdom. Something I find quite distasteful about humanity is that we have this herd mentality. Our, our desire to belong is, is so strong that we will do anything to belong. Uh, we end up fitting so comfortably into our culture that we don't think about it. Instead, we judge anyone that is not like us. We put up our high walls to keep those who are out, out and keep those who are in, in. Um, and if somebody is in, you will defend them no matter what they have done. And when somebody is out, you will do whatever it takes to keep them out. But the kingdom of God is supra-cultural. It sits above any culture. It does not conform to me, but it is above me. So God's kingdom is inclusive of all nations. 
in Romans 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, here, what I am not saying. I'm not saying that we have to abandon our culture because it is part of our identity and our identity is part of the image of God. What I am saying is that we have to renew our minds in order to see the will of God, which is that the kingdom will be full of people from every tongue and tribe and nation. The kingdom of God will be incomplete if all the nations are not represented fully. We have to renew our minds to let go of these cultural prejudices. Then we will begin to see the beauty of God's perfect will. For his kingdom to be a kaleidoscope of cultural expressions that are united and one. In Jesus Christ. Point number five. The kingdom of God is a naturally supernatural kingdom. Someone once said that we should not be so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good, nor should we be so earthly minded that we are no heavenly good. Uh, God's intention for us is that we are in the world, but not of the world. In Joel 2, verse 28 to 29, we read, And afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. So we are not to become isolated from the world as we turn to Jesus. We are meant to to minister Jesus to the world around us. Uh, the beauty of God's kingdom is that it is a naturally supernatural kingdom. We are not removed from this broken world. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue the mission of the Son for the glory of the Father. So because of Jesus coming to us, uh, we, we can now live in the presence of the future. We can experience the future blessings of God's kingdom in the ordinary moments of our daily lives. We are kingdom expressions looking for moments in which to happen. We, we may struggle with the frailties of this life. We may, we may suffer. We may grow old and we may die. But in the midst of it all, we have these glimpses of glory, of the power of the kingdom of God breaking through and transforming a life or touching a heart or making that crucial difference in somebody's life. The kingdom of God is a naturally supernatural kingdom. My final point, you'll be happy to know, is that God's kingdom is an eternally becoming kingdom. Uh, when we read the parables of the mustard seed and of the yeast and of the sower, we see that God's kingdom starts uh, as something small, but it keeps on growing until it encompasses everything. So God's kingdom is an eternally becoming kingdom. In Isaiah 9, you may uh, remember that we read that of the increase of Jesus' government and peace, there will be no end. In Daniel, uh, we read about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, where uh, a rock comes and it destroys the, all the kingdoms of this world, and it grows to become a mountain that fills the whole earth. Uh, Daniel goes on to prophesy uh, about Jesus in Daniel 7 verse 14. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Paul describes Jesus as raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God. 
And Ephesians 1.21 goes on to say, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the age also to come. So God's kingdom is an eternally becoming kingdom because it will continue to increase in power forever and ever. God's kingdom is an eternally becoming kingdom because it will continue to increase forever and ever. It will become more than what it is, for as we worship, He will build His throne and establish a greater peace and ever-increasing measure. So praise be to God. So, just to summarize what I've been sharing this morning, is that Advent is about the coming of King Jesus, through whom all the nations of the earth are blessed, and whose kingdom is an upside-down, inside-out, back-to-front, supracultural, naturally supernatural, and eternally becoming kingdom. So, This is your personal invitation to receive King Jesus into your life. He who gets the king gets everything. And he who seeks first the kingdom of God and its righteousness will receive everything in Christ Jesus. So we can say Amen and Amen. Uh, We will have uh, a Christmas service on available on YouTube for you to watch any time of the day. Um, but for now, I just want to wish you a great Christmas and a blessed New Year. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you that you are the coming King, that you have come to bless all the nations, that all of us who are included in your great and perfect plan. And thank you, Lord, that your kingdom is so amazing. It includes even me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that your kingdom is not like any kingdom in this world, but it is the exact opposite of what the world has uh, created. Your kingdom is an amazing kingdom, an upside down, inside out, back to front, supracultural, supernatural, and eternally becoming king. And we have the privilege to be a part of that. So we just want to thank you this morning. And we want to glorify your name. Amen. Noel, the angels did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep.
king. <laughs>